Hello everyone. Hope you had a good lunch. Right. So we are going to talk about using Kubernetes API effectively with Golang. So quick introduction. My name is Vishal. I am CTO and founder at Infocore Technologies. I am also a contributor to Fission project. It's a serverless project on top of Kubernetes. Uh, I'm a GD on Kubernetes, and I also organize Pune Kubernetes Meetup and serverless meetups. So if you're in the town, uh, we do it every month. Join us. Uh, another small quick announcement. We are doing a workshop specially for women on Kubernetes, 6th of April, Pune. Uh, please register and uh, join us on 6th of April. Uh, the slide will be up on my Twitter handle right after this uh, talk, so you can check out the link there. Another quick announcement. We just open source BotCube. Uh, it's a Slack bot which allows you to talk to Kubernetes. So kubectl from Slack. And we're adding Mattermost support uh, and adding a bunch of other things uh, pretty soon. Uh, you can check out at our booth uh, on the second floor and win a t-shirt. Right. And we are hiring uh, Kubernetes, Golang, open source, and a bunch of other things. So quick questions before we dive into the talk. Uh, how many of you uh, write code in Golang? Please hands up. OK, that's a pretty good number. Uh, have you ever written a controller? Right, quite a few there. And lastly, did you attend GopherCon 2018? So for those of you who attended GopherCon, uh, some of these things might be uh, a little repetitive for you. Uh, you can sleep <laughs> while I talk. Cool. So the goal of my talk today is two things. Uh, introduce the vocabulary uh, in the client Go when you're writing applications against Kubernetes API. Uh, things like what is the controller, what is the indexer, and then explore some of the basic best practices for developing Kubernetes native applications. Uh, this is meant to be a starter talk for somebody who is completely new to Kubernetes controllers, writing controllers, uh, getting started on those areas. And there's a GitHub repo as well on the GitHub. Uh, you can clone it, you can try to run it, play around with it as a starting point. Uh, again, the slides will be up on my Twitter handle pretty shortly. Cool. So before we dive into the code and concepts, let's quickly look at the library structure. So the API machinery uh, is a separate project on GitHub under Kubernetes organization, which basically has the schema, the encoding, the decodings for all the objects that are Kubernetes APIs. Uh, the client code is what you will typically deal with, which is the client Go library. Uh, it has things like informers, uh, listers, watchers, uh, and you'll write controllers using this code, uh, typically. So without too much slides, what I want to do is I want to quickly dive into code. We'll start with a very simple program, Go program, uh, where we authenticate with the cluster, and we try to list the parts that are in the Hello. cluster. So all right. So this is my simple CRUD operation class. Uh, what I'm doing here is first getting handled to Kubernetes. And the way I do it uh, uh, is two ways. So if you're within the cluster, you can use in cluster config to get handled to the client set. And uh, then rest of the operations follow uh, using client set. So think of it like a connection pool uh, handled to a database, similar thing for Kubernetes, right? And if you're outside cluster, you'll typically use kube config. Uh, and the kube config is the way you get in the cluster, basically. So that's the authentication part. Once we have got that, uh, what we are doing is using the client set of Kubernetes, we are saying, I'm going to talk to the code v1 API. Now, for those of you who are aware, uh, Kubernetes follows the uh, API naming convention. Uh, there is v1, there is alpha, beta. So based on where your object is, uh, you will use one of those uh, methods. And I want to list parts here. So parts, again, uh, is a basic unit of requirement in Kubernetes. And here, I'm passing an empty string. That means I don't care about the namespace in which the parts exist. I want to list all the parts. And then I'm calling list methods on that. But in the list method, I'm passing something more. I'm doing a meta even list options. What does it do? So let's say I want to filter. I want to filter all the parts that have label as database or that are in certain namespace. So all those list options is what you can pass in the list method. And I won't go too much detail uh, in that specifically, uh, but you can basically slice and dice your filters uh, to get the parts from Kubernetes. Uh, so here what we're doing is getting the parts, checking if there is any error uh, while we got the parts from Kubernetes, and then simply iterating over uh, the list of parts and printing them on the console. So let's try to run this, and let's see how that goes. So 
So I'm in the same repository uh, that the code base was being talked about. And I have already compiled the code into a binary. So I'm simply going to run that binary without any arguments. That will just give me the help. Now I'm going to say, I'm going to do CRUD. So what is happening is, it went, uh, fetched the list of parts, and simply listed all the parts that we had. The numbering, of course, was added additionally by, by the program. So these are the parts which are running right now in my Kubernetes cluster. It's pretty simple, nothing complicated so far. So that is a basic, simple, 101, hello world, talking to Kubernetes API using client library. Cool. Now I want to introduce a new concept here, concept of controller. Uh, what is a controller? It's nothing but active loop, uh, which is trying to bring the desired state to the current state, right? So we specify the desired state using a YAML file, using a Go program, and we say, hey, kubectl apply this YAML to Kubernetes cluster, right? And then Kubernetes sees there is this desired state, uh, which says three parts of Nginx should be running in my cluster, but there is nothing. And then the controller loop kicks in and says, okay, let's get the current state to desired state. So it brings up the three parts and three parts are running in the cluster, right? Uh, of course, this is an oversimplification of the whole controller loop, but the basic concept remains the same, right? There are a lot of details that we'll go through uh, shortly, but the basic idea remains the same. You get the, current, uh, you get the desired state, you get the current state, and then you do a kind of reconciliation. So there are some building blocks, uh, you know, when you write controllers, and I want to talk about some of these building blocks, uh, which are uh, good to understand for a newbie starting with uh, client go programming. So first thing is a list watcher. What does list watcher do? It basically lists out objects like we did in the previous program, but it also watches them. So listing is one thing, but if you want to watch them, so once I have listed all the 50 pods that are running in my cluster right now, I want to watch. Is there a new pod that got added? Is there a new pod that got deleted? Or is something that got updated, right? And the basic comparison is done using resource version. So resource version is one of the fields in the metadata uh, of the objects. And if an uh, object changes, the resource version is changed. Uh, so that is the basic uh, list watcher. Then there is store. So once you have got the list of objects from the Kubernetes cluster, you want to store them somewhere locally. Uh, and that's where store helps you uh, store objects in memory. Uh, but if I'm getting a large number of objects, let's say I'm getting 3,000 parts, and I want to uh, filter them further locally, not, not while getting from the server, I'll use something called as indexer. So indexer gives you an indexing function. So I can say, this is my indexing function, apply this function to this uh, list of parts, and give me only the one that matches the indexing function, right? So it is almost like a filter. Uh, you can do that using indexing function. Then there is informer. So you get a list of objects, you keep watching them, but I want somebody to be informed that, hey, this pod got added, or this pod got deleted, or this pod got updated, right? So informer is the bridge between listing and watching from the server to a local cache, uh, you know, informing that. And informer could also be a shared informer. So let's talk about a use case, right? Uh, I have a pod that is getting added to the cluster, but there are three parties that are interested in knowing a pod got added. So I can use a shared informer and inform three different consumers that, hey, a pod got added, and those can do whatever they want to do with that pod information, right? Similarly, there is reflector. So it watches a list watcher and updates data uh, in the store. So you don't have to, again, go and fetch the data from, from server. Uh, the in-memory cache is getting updated using reflector. So it reflects what is on the server in your local cache. Then there is work queue. Now, let's say I get 1,000 items from the server, like 1,000 parts got added, right? If I keep processing them serially, it's going to take 1,000 into the number of time or amount of time it takes to process one part. I want to parallelize this. So instead of directly processing, what I do is I put them in a queue. And then from queue, I have subscribers who are going to process these items. So I'm basically using the queue and the worker pattern pretty much. And uh, I can have multiple workers process the parts. So I can do 1,000 parts maybe four workers, so 250 parts by one worker. So I can reduce my time from one to one fourth, sort of. Then there is rate limiting queue. So in addition to uh, just getting it from a queue and giving it to X number of consumers, you can limit the rate of the queue. For example, if I'm dealing with something which is uh, traffic intensive, it can only handle, let's say, 100 requests per second, 
I want one worker to just get 100 at a time, not more than 100, right? So I somehow define a rate at which it should be limited. Then there is delaying queue. So I got the part from the list, I got from the queue into a worker, and the worker tries to talk to an external system, but it fails. If it fails, uh, try at least one more time. We are talking about distributed systems, things are going to fail, so try one more time. So delaying queue allows you to do that retry uh, back of loop uh, in, the, in the program. Cool. So having talked about so many concepts, let's dive into some more code. Uh, build a simple controller and then build a slightly advanced controller. Uh, I don't know if this is visible all the way till back. Do you want me to increase the font some more? All right. So, as usual, we get the handle to Kubernetes, uh, nothing but simple uh, client set. And I created a new list watcher from client. Now, last time we just listed, this time we are creating a watcher from the cache. And I say this is my client set, so pass the rest client. And I'm only interested in parts. And I'm interested in all the fields of the part. So that's why I say fields or everything. If I'm only interested in a certain number of fields, I can specify their names and only get those fields. And then from listwatch, I create a new informer. So again, I use the cache package to create a new informer. Pass my listwatch, which I created in the previous day. And then I say all the objects that are coming from this listwatch, please convert them to a part object. And please sync every five seconds. And if something happens, so I'm writing two functions here, which are inner functions, a add function and a delete function. So if add function gets called, uh, please do XYZ. And if delete function gets called, please do XYZ. And then I'm finally making a stop channel and simply saying controller run. So what this is going to do is initially list all the parts that are in the control uh, Kubernetes and then keep watching for them. So what we'll do now in the console is run this informer. Uh, see all the parts getting listed, and then in a different console, try to add a part and see what happens. Right. So run an example, the informer uh, example. So all the parts that were added have already been listed here. Let's go to a different uh, console and run a simple Nginx uh, in Nginx namespace. And we see at the top, the pod got added. So our addition method for that controller got called, basically. Similarly, I'm going to do uh, remove, and it should give me a delete event. I don't know if I'm watching for delete events. Yes, I am. So again, I got a delete notification, right? So these are like basic, simple building blocks for building uh, Kubernetes controllers using client library. Now we looked at the example of informer. Let's look at another example of work queue. Excuse me. So initial steps, pretty similar to what we did in the previous examples. We get a Kubernetes handle. Uh, this time though, we are creating a default new rate limiting queue. And we are saying just use the default controller rate limiter. The beautiful part is with client go, you can actually click here and read the documentation on that method, what exactly it does, right? So you don't necessarily refer to uh, something. Your code itself is explaining you what needs to be done here, right? Uh, and then I'm creating a list watcher, uh, very similar to like last time, uh, just watching all the parts for all the fields. And then I use a new indexer informer, uh, pass the list watch, and this time I'm only talking about add function. So I don't care about delete or update function in this case. And I get an indexer and informer objects out of this. So if you compare with last example, we're not getting a controller and directly running it. We are just getting the indexer and informer. Right? And we created the queue in the first place. Right? So using these three things, the informer, indexer, and the queue, I'm creating a simple uh, object, a struct basically, which houses all three, the informer, indexer, and queue. And I have defined the definition of the struct at the top, right? the type controller. Now what I do is, uh, on this controller, I'm going to call run method and pass a stop channel. So until this program is killed, this will keep running uh, forever. Now, if you look at the run method, what we're doing is uh, we are saying defer the shutdown of the queue, but uh, for each item, basically. So wait for the cashier to sing, and for each item, uh, you call the worker. So worker here uh, is the actual thing that does the heavy lifting, so to speak, and it is calling the process next item. 
So now technically, this process next item could be done in a different part, and I could scale it out horizontally, right? So of course here we are showing with the same uh, file or same part, uh, but in practice you could do this in two different processes. And this process next item is what could be multiple of them pulling from the same work queue and try to get the data, right? And here I'm just getting the key of the object uh, and dequeuing from the queue and then say, you know, process some business logic. So typically you would do all the stuff that you need to do with the pod or any other object in Kubernetes uh, using the sort of business logic method. And if it doesn't exist, we are doing a bunch of things. So let's run this example. So like last time, it just uh, listed everything. And we'll do similar thing here again. So in practice, you don't see anything different, obviously, because we are calling the process uh, next item in the same uh, thread or in the same uh, process, so to speak. But you could kind of parallelize this all and uh, build a pretty scalable uh, system. All right. So back to our slides. So some of the best practices. So Kubernetes at the end is a distributed system. And, and all the principles that apply to a normal distributed system apply to Kubernetes as well. Uh, every time you get a list of objects, don't operate them on them immediately. Queue them somewhere and operate. Again, a pretty standard practice. Uh, decouple the operator from the one who is giving you the objects, right? So like we use work queue, uh, you could use a work queue, have a set of workers, and then operate using the workers. That way, workers can scale horizontally, horizontally tomorrow. Uh, if there is an error, uh, don't just throw off. There might be network latency, there might be storage issues, uh, there might be difference of uh, latency between one machine to other machine in the cluster, or between different availability zones in the same cluster, right? So if error occurs, retry and requeue. So have a proper retry back of loop. Uh, don't assume any order. Uh, so you could have potentially two or three controllers looking at the same object. And you can't assume that controller one is going to get the pod first, and controller two is going to get the pod later, right? So you can't assume that order. You can't rely on that order for any uh, processing. You also can't assume there is not going to be any latency. If you're running a highly available cluster uh, in three zones in any given region, there's going to be some amount of latency, right? And don't assume you're not going to miss events. Your applications will crash. The network will crash. Everything else can crash. So don't assume uh, you know, you're not going to miss events, and, and everything is going to just work fine. When in doubt, uh, check the resource version. Resource version is the indicator to tell you if something has changed from last time. You don't need to compare all the attributes of the object. Just look at the resource version and you're more or less good. Uh, object relations. So for those of you who are aware, uh, Kubernetes has a concept of owner reference. Uh, for example, a replica set has an owner reference of deployment. And pod has an owner reference of replica set. So you can use that uh, to do a lot of cascading things. For example, if I delete deployment, I want my replica set as well as pods to be deleted. And that is done using owner reference, right? So for objects that are related, uh, use owner reference to kind of relate them to each other. Uh, there are multiple actors. So uh, for all the pods or all the objects that are getting created or deleted, you're not the only controller who is doing operations on them, right? So you might get an object in the cache. Somebody else might have modified in between. And there might be a new event for that, right? So you don't always assume there's going to be more than one actor uh, trying to change things apart from yourself. Uh, so that's all more or less for my talk. Uh, the controller talk on the Kubernetes uh, GitHub page are a really good read, a pretty good read for a first uh, time starter. Uh, there are some sample controllers built in Calico, or in fact, any other project that is Helm, there is Fission. Uh, in fact, any other project that is written on top of Kubernetes as the base uh, it will have controllers of some or the other form. Uh, Elena from Rancher, her talk at KubeCon uh, 2017 is also a great uh, starter for, for these uh, topics, especially. Uh, that's all I have from my side. Uh, thanks for listening to me. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm open to take them. No, no.